and welcome. I'm Peter Rossig. I'm your host for the Two Wheel Revolution here on thinktechhawaii.com. This is a program where we talk about uh, the geeky word micro mobility or personal mobility or getting around in ways other than cars primarily, bicycles, e-bikes, e-scooters, e-skateboards, uh, and uh, pretty soon we're going to have e-skates, uh, I think, to uh, talk about. But uh, today we've got two guests from the Hawaii Bicycling League, and of course bicycles are still the main way that people uh, do get around when they're not, uh, you know, on the bus or in, in automobiles. So uh, welcome to Travis Council, who's Executive Director. Aloha, Travis. Thanks for having us. And Tim Cristalis, who's the Events Manager for HBL and who's pretty busy right now because we're about we're only about three, a little over three weeks out from uh, the Century Ride. Is that is that about right, Chris? Yeah, just over uh, three weeks. It'll be three weeks this Sunday. All right. So uh, many people will see this after the event, but uh, it is before the event. It's on the 24th of September. And um, tell us about it. Tell us what's going to happen. Tell us what to expect. It is the 40th anniversary of the Honolulu Century Ride. It's a ride that starts and ends at Kapolei Park. Um, we head out along the coast, out to Hawaii Kai, and then through Kailua, through Kapolei, and, or, or I mean Kaneohe, and then up to Swansea Beach where we turn around and come back. It has seven aid stations and it's a fully supported and a great time and a good excuse to get out since uh, it's our largest fundraiser. All right. Now, I personally don't want to ride uh, 100 miles. Uh, what am I going to do? Uh, we have shorter options. There's 25, 50, 75 mile turnaround points. Of course, you could turn around wherever uh, you feel comfortable with riding that day. We do have a Aloha uh, Fun Ride, which is a short family oriented ride that just takes you off to Kahala and back. It's only eight miles, but it uses the same finish area as the Honolulu Century Ride. So there's plenty to celebrate there. All right. And uh, did you say how many people you expect uh, we're going to be riding? We're expecting around 12, 1,300 people this year. Is that a high number or a low number for these rides historically? Historically, it's a little bit lower compared. We saw uh, some pretty good participation in the early 2000s, but for the last like decade, it seems pretty on par with what we've, uh, what we've been seeing. But you missed a year or two uh, with COVID, I, I think. Yes, we did. We missed uh, 2020 and 2021. Okay. Travis, what's the significance, uh, the 40th uh, time this event has been held? Uh, it's a pretty awesome number. What's the significance of 40 times? Yeah, I mean, it uh, just really shows the longevity uh, of an event like this. Uh, we, you can kind of see behind me, we, we keep a lot of the ride shirts from our older rides all the way back into the 80s. Uh, and a lot of our members have participated in dozens, if not more, uh, of those rides. Uh, it has certainly evolved and, and changed a little over the years. But in general, the course is about the same as it was in the 1980s. Uh, and it's, it's an amazing event that really is, uh, we, we, we pin it as the best day to ride Aloha, just because you're going to be out there with a thousand of your other cycling friends and uh, and it does support uh, a great cause that helps uh, you know fund our advocacy and our education events uh, throughout the throughout the year so and Chris what goes into you know pulling off an event like this um, it's a kind of a big deal roads closed cops everywhere aid stations what's involved uh, orchestrating <laughs> the permits for the street usage and park usage, uh, getting the cops there and assigning what uh, intersections they're at to kind of facilitate traffic. And we advise everyone to follow the laws and that it's just a ride, not a race, but it's still a great time to be out there. Um, so safety is always a uh, number one concern. And with that, we have uh, roaming course support that can help you if you need help with a flat or if you have some other mechanical um, and then all the aid stations have medical and mechanical help as well with like stuff to uh, rehydrate with and refuel with. We have snacks out there. A um, lot of moving pieces, but it uh, it all comes together and it it's always a, an amazing feeling when it's uh, all over and said and done with. And you get to take a, a couple of days off maybe, <laughs> right? 
So what's gonna what's it gonna be like at the finish line? You're gonna have all these different the hundred milers, the fifty milers, all uh, the family fun folks. They're all gonna be uh, at the finish line in Kapiolani Park. What's gonna be happening there? We have some live music scheduled at the bandstand. We have uh, the Royal Hawaiian Band and the Air Force Band and the Pacific Fleet Band all playing starting at 10.30 in the morning. Uh, we'll have uh, food vendors. We have some of our nonprofit partners that we work with throughout the year that will be there giving out information and educational materials. And uh, we're going to have some activities for the kids, a little bike rodeo where they can bike through cones and do a little obstacle course. Um, but yeah. Good times. All right. And speaking of kids, Travis, one of the big functions or activities of the HBL is education. And uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Remind us what kind of education programs are going? Of course. Yeah. So education, as you said, is one of our kind of three focuses. We have advocacy, education, and events. Uh, so education is definitely the one that, that uh, probably has some of the biggest impacts in, in the community sense. Uh, our largest program and our oldest program is our, our Bike Ed Hawaii. Probably more people know Bike Ed than, than they do HBL, but we administer that program, uh, which teaches fourth grades across Oahu uh, bike safety. It's a week long course, uh, basically like a gym class for the students, but teach them how to ride their bikes safely to school uh, and, and kind of the basic rules of the road, if you will, so that they're out there being safe. We also have adult education programs like fixing a flat uh, or teaching somebody how to uh, ride comfortably on the road with traffic. Uh, and we even have a uh, senior cycling. So this is a uh, adult uh, recumbent bikes uh, so that balancing is less of a concern, uh, but just keeps people moving uh, at an older age as well. And I think you, you joined us on one of those a couple uh, months ago and uh, got to experience that program out in the Pearl Harbor Historic Trail. Yeah, I did. It was great. Uh, you have a bunch of, I don't know how many, but certainly enough for us. You had uh, tri the recumbent trikes, uh, tricycles. So you are leaning back and you're, you're pretty hard to fall over, I think. Uh, I couldn't do it. And if I can't fall over, nobody can fall over, I'll tell you that. <laughs> I always start my bike riding. When I do bicycle touring in Europe, I always have to have one fall so that I, once it's out of the way, I don't have to worry about it anymore. Uh, I don't advise that, but <laughs> it seems to be the way it works. Okay, so, um, and, and that education program, uh, is there more you would do, or do you think that covers the waterfront? Are there other educational items? Uh, uh, and I'll tell you why I ask. At the end of the show, I'm going to do a little promo for a, an e-bike uh, course that the uh, League of American Cyclists and People for Bikes have put online. And um, for somebody that's just getting started or hasn't started, I think that's probably a pretty good start. Uh, but with more and more e-bikes, I wonder if there's going to be a need for uh, a particular e-bike, electric bike courses, or uh, are there other education programs you think we need to, to look at? Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head with the e-bikes. We, we've done a couple smaller kind of test uh, e-bike classes or kind of intro or, or people that are curious about e-bikes. And we're actually working with uh, the uh, Hawaii Department of Transportation to potentially have some funding to expand those offerings um, so that, that people that either get an e-bike, uh, are curious about an e-bike, uh, can, can kind of learn, you know, there aren't different rules of the road, but they are a different than a traditional bike in the sense of the speed that they might go or uh, the power, those types of things. So uh, they're really important there. And I think kind of even expanding that to just some of the more emerging technologies you mentioned at the beginning of the, the show around scooters and the one wheels and the different devices that aren't your traditional car, bike, walk uh, mindset. So I think expanding into that. Additionally, we have uh, education workshops and, and kind of presentations that I'd like to see expanded that are focused more on, on the other users of the road, predominantly the people driving, um, really to just emphasize safety and responsibility of sharing the road and, and being aware of other users. Uh, when you explain to somebody that a person on a bike has the same rights as the person in a car, uh, it sometimes surprises people. Uh, but the more that you can kind of emphasize that the laws are, you know, in, in fact there, uh, that you can kind of make more people aware uh, and ideally, uh, less less conflicts and less you know crashes and and ultimately less injuries and fatalities. 
All right. And I noticed you said crashes. We don't say accidents anymore, right? We say yes. crashes because uh, they're, they're the result of somebody not doing what they needed to do. They're not accidents. Exactly. Accident removes the, the concept of fault. Uh, as soon as you say accident, there's no fault there. It's, you know, it's just a, an act that happened where a crash is, crash is, is more just a term. It's a, it's a fact that it occurred. Uh, so we allow basically either, I don't want to say fault, but responsibility and additional details to fill in the gaps. But uh, at least in the initial stage, it's a crash uh, or a collision. Uh, it's not an accident. Accidents are uh, fairly rare. Let's put it that way. Okay. Chris, uh, going back for a minute to the, the century ride, you told me, I think, that there's some people who have been who've written other century rides or written many century rides. Uh, tell me a little more about that. Yes, uh, a couple people have reached out to me uh, asking questions about the ride. They're coming from the mainland. Uh, they've ridden in 49 states a century ride in each of them, and they they've saved Hawaii as their their crown jewel, their their 50th uh, century ride in a state. So that's pretty exciting that they uh, have like chosen and planned out and set that kind of bucket list goal for themselves to ride a century in, in every U.S. state. And they're uh, all three of them are choose like independently. They're, they, they aren't known to each other. Just happens to be that they are choosing this century ride to uh, do it, which is exciting and fun. That's cool. Are you going to get them a special jersey or a special number or something so we can see who, uh, where, where these 50th? The, the, uh, the, the first one, because I think she's celebrating her birthday as well. I like, sent out a bunch of uh, friends to do it. Uh, I gave her the, the 50th bib. Um, so that should be a, a surprise to her. All right. Good to take care. Good to take care of her. So eventually, this is going to be like the holidays marathon, right? It'll be a big tourist event. People will be coming from all over the country, uh, all over the world, to ride in uh, in century rides here. Uh, would that be a good thing? That would be a good thing. I think we we are already seeing. We see some international people coming. Uh, we have, I think, for, just compared to last year, we have more people from like California. Oregon, Washington that are coming. I've checked the registration and it seems like our mainland numbers are are up. So that's nice. I, uh, as a runner as well, I feel like it's just a little bit harder. You have that uh, increased cost and problems and logistics of bringing your bike when you travel. Uh, but yeah, we would love to see us, uh, see the, the Honolulu Century Ride grow to be as big as the Honolulu Marathon. But it, uh, It'll take a few years, but you know there are some, problems, some logistical problems with the bike. Yeah, hey, have it grow a and little just bit kind every of, year. On that note, in addition to being the 40th anniversary, this year is our 20th, uh, or I guess 20th event, but uh, over 20 years of support from Japan Airlines, one of our sponsors, and and they're a big partner of bringing uh, a couple hundred, uh, at one point almost a thousand people over from from Japan, um, largely because they provide a, a bike uh, waiver. Uh, to to travel with uh, with your bike if you're coming over and flying with them, so I think that helps make it a little easier to bring your bike to this event and and kind of create a partnership with uh, the Japanese riding community. Yeah, that's terrific. I didn't I didn't know that Japanese are big bicycle riders, both for uh, just logistically getting around their neighborhoods, getting to the train stations and things like that. Uh, so uh, that that's great. And you know, as, as this grows into it. National international event, the Hawaii Tourism Authority ought to kick in a couple bucks to help make that ha you know make that a reality. Nice that you said that. They were actually uh, this year is the first year that we've uh, received their community enrichment program award. Um, so they are they are a supporter as well this year. So hopefully that'll be a sign of good things to come for future years as well. Uh, well that's terrific because uh, everyone says, and I believe that Hawaii is uh, the place to bicycle. It's ideal in terms of weather year round. Uh, we need to get a little more infrastructure out there. We need to get a little more driver education and bike cycler education. But, uh, you know, we'll, we're on the way to being the Copenhagen of the Pacific, right? Yeah. I was going to say, when I uh, I was always a, like a cyclist. I always enjoyed it. But when I moved to Hawaii 15 years ago, it really just enabled me to really lean into it and develop a passion for cycling. Like, I still remember the first time I rode to Hawaii Kai and turned around and saw how far away Diamond Head was and all that. It's it's really a great place to bike. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, I, I, I cycled when I, I lived in Japan before I came to Hawaii to go to University of Hawaii at Manoa. And uh, I did a bicycle ride from the north to the south, ending up in, uh, in Shikoku in Japan. And then I packed my bike into a, uh, a bag and I brought it with me on the plane and got off the plane. And uh, I didn't quite have the guts to put my bike together and ride it up to Manoa, but I was, I was riding uh, pretty soon after that. So, um, I, you know, I think, I think that's great. Um, speaking of travel and international stuff, uh, Travis, I know you've been traveling a bit and uh, you were, you were going to tell me about Sydney, I think. Yeah, we were speaking offline just briefly. I, I had, uh, I, I had literally just a layover. It was 24 hours in Sydney. Um, and we wanted to kind of see it all. And my wife and I were traveling and, uh, and it was, it was one of those experiences where I walked away saying, this is an amazing city that, that has some things figured out. Uh, you know, some examples that I would love to bring home, uh, in, in particular, their public transportation was just uh, amazing from, uh, you know, moving people around and ease of access. You didn't have to get a, a rider card or anything. It just, you tap your phone or your, or your, uh, credit card and, and it bills you at the end of the day, which was impressive uh no no you know bus cards or anything like that and uh, it even included ferries and trolleys and uh, buses so quite cool to see that and, and then a lot of bike specific bike specific infrastructure most of it either divided uh you know in the sense of uh, protected or completely off the road i had the unique experience of actually walking uh, on a multi-use path from the international airport to our hotel, which was in a in a you know off-site hotel, about ten minute walk away. I don't think I've ever walked. I could have biked. There were nice bike lockers and things from the airport to our hotel. I was quite impressed uh, with uh, with that infrastructure and uh, took some notes to to bring back to some of our advocacy meetings and conversations uh, locally here as well. Well, that's cool. Usually, I think of going to, as I said, Copenhagen or Amsterdam to see uh, the, what what bikes could be. But you're saying we should go to Sydney and take a look. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's still not a short flight, but it is uh, another another great destination. And uh, I've had the you know fortune to go over to Copenhagen or or some of the other Scandinavian cities up uh, Norway and other places that. Are truly, you know, amazing and and you know, decades ahead of where we are, but certainly worthwhile examples that we should be striving to to work towards. All right, Chris. Uh, I'm gonna, I keep thinking of things I want to ask you about the Century Ride. Uh, you can't possibly put all this off without a number of volunteers. I'm guessing. So, what kind of volunteer help do you need? We need volunteers for. Just about almost everything. I think we, over the course of the Century Ride, we have about 300 volunteers. Uh, everything from helping at packet pickup to loading the aid station trucks and delivering aid supplies across uh, Oahu, that 100 mile course. Um, we have uh, course marshals that are out there driving, helping cyclists that need help. Um, yeah, uh, it would not be possible without volunteers. And so if someone uh, does see this before the event this year or in future events in future years and they want to volunteer, uh, how do they do that? We have a, a little spot on the website at hbl.org uh, slash HCR that has information for volunteers. But then also uh, Lauren is our volunteer coordinator and you could reach her at Lauren at hbl.org as well. Um, are you doing the, the last year? I think you initiated the bus and bike or bike and bus. Yeah, bike uh, and bus. Bike and bus. Okay. Uh, which, and uh, are you doing that again this year? Yeah. Um, if it's essentially for someone that wants to see the whole course, but only bike half of it, you can bike the 50 miles out to Swansea Beach Park and then catch a bus back to the park. Uh, we handle the bike transportation and uh, we have a partnership with Robert Tawai that uh, supplies the bus. and. It's a nice little setup for you to see the whole course if, if, without riding all 100 miles. Can I do it the other way around? Can I take the bus out to there, out there and bike back? You know, we thought about that last year, but uh, it saw no interest. So all right. we're, well, we're I'm keeping only, it. I'm the only one that wants to do that. So <laughs> don't, 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 bother for, don't bother for me. Okay. That would also put you biking in the hottest part of the day. Oh, that's a good point. That's a good point. So I ought to do the bike <laughs> while it's still relatively cool. 
So there's so many ways to be involved here. And, and just for the record, uh, are there any any kind of bike, any kind of uh, any kind of two wheel, three wheel, four wheel? Can I pay bring my electric bike? Are there any kind of limitations here? The only thing we say is that you know ideally you're you're going with the the flow of the other people riding. So if you are bringing an e-bike, it's not a high powered or you know electric motorcycle style. It ideally probably doesn't even have a throttle. It's more of a pedal assist. Uh, this is a bicycling event, so it should resemble a bicycle and and kind of be able to you know not be a, a safety hazard by going faster than everybody else. Yeah, but right, e-bikes right. are certainly welcome, and we do see a lot of them, which is great. Uh, okay. as, right. as the range gets better and better, people can go a little further too. So yeah, I'm guessing that you're going to see more every year. I think they're I think the uh, you know I think the electric bike is changing and is going to change a lot of things. Uh, I'm an enthusiast, as you well know. Uh, I see them in Europe uh, more and more uh, everywhere. Uh, they take out, you know, the, they take away some of the sweat factor and they take away some of the, the uh, you know, the distance factor and make them uh, ideal. I, every, I bug Bicky every time I talk to Todd Bolanger. When are we going to get those electric Bickies? <laughs> yep. I'm waiting. I think Hawaii Island will actually see electric uh, bike share bikes before Bicky. So it'll be a good test run over there. They got a, a transportation alternatives grant that covers a few uh, new stations, which will have e-bikes incorporated in, in Kona and Hilo. So, well, and, and hopefully idea. that'll trickle over to, uh, to Bicky on, uh, on Oahu as well. well. That's very good to know. And you, I hope you'll let me know when that's up and running yeah. and I want to talk to whoever's in charge of that. And, you know, in a way, the distance is the one thing about the big island is that you know they've got the space and the distance so uh a, an e-bike would be especially useful there i'm not sure if you're going to go across saddle road on one uh, yeah it could be a little a little bit of a challenge there i think <laughs> yeah. another nice thing here is we have the e-bike rebate um not many states have an e-bike rebate right. uh, and hawaii has you know we've got statistics recently and it was almost 300 people that had taken advantage of, of the e-bike rebate, um, which isn't a ton, but it's certainly a good start. Yeah. And, and we're big supporters of expanding that program. So uh, if, if it were to be expanded, we could talk a little bit about advocacy and that sort of thing. Uh, we only have about five minutes left. But um, if, if you, it seemed to me that it was a good start, but then you look at somebody like someplace like Denver and, you know, they open up a new uh, tranche of, of, uh, of, of e-bike rebates and and you know before the end of the day they're gone and mm -hmm. they're all spoken for what can we do to make uh our to get into that kind of of uptake uh here do you think yeah i mean i think some of the the barriers to entry that they've been looking to reduce uh specifically is the where and when you get that rebate currently it's a you know a rebate where you have to purchase and then submit for reimbursement and then finally receive a check where in Denver it's you know the bike shop is the place literally at the at the point of sale you receive that discount off that bike and then the bike shop submits their their records so kind of reducing some some entry points there would be great or making it easier um, I think you know as we just see more you mentioned e-bikes are becoming more and more popular the technology is getting better the price point is coming down for some of them some of them still remain very expensive for fancy ones but I think we're going to see that demand increase, um, and and just you know as that grows, we're seeing places like Costco and other places starting to carry e-bikes. So uh, I, I think uh, ensuring that there's enough funds in this rebate program and that the promotion of it is widespread. Um, there's some talk about expanding the eligibility. That currently it's it's I don't want to say restrictive, but it's uh, certain limited. individuals um, don't qualify. But um, but yeah, just making sure that we get everybody that would benefit from this uh, and make them aware of the program. I think it's the big push. Okay, um, I do know, and I've been, I am involved, full disclosure, in, in some of the advocacy efforts. And I, I hope we'll have you come back toward the end of the year before the next session of the ledge and talk a little bit more about some of those uh, activities because uh, I think advocacy and making sure things happen the right way. Uh, uh, is a very important part of what the HBL does and wants to do. So we'll return to that uh, if we can later in the year. Uh, I'm going to give you each a minute to wrap up here, and then I'm going to have a micro-mobility moment. 
uh, <laughs> that I try to end every every program with. So, uh, Chris, give us uh, give us the twenty five words or less about why we should ride the uh, century. Uh, twenty five words or less. I would say ride the century because it. No matter how many miles you ride, you don't. I feel like it can inspire you to ride more. Like you never know where that passion might come from. I remember riding the my first century ride and just loving the challenge of it. And it's it's a it's a great atmosphere and it's a great place to it's a great occasion to ride. That was twenty six words, but I'll let you go. I uh, it was it was a little much. All right, Travis, uh, from the Bicycle League, uh, what, what would you say to people? Should they join? Should they uh, send you money? Let me guess. Uh, what can people do to make sure the, the HBL is going to operate successfully? Yeah, I think, I think just general support uh, is always welcomed. We certainly represent far more people than just people who bike. It can be people who walk, roll. Even people who drive should should support better infrastructure for people that bike to to make the roads safer for everybody. So get involved in whatever way means means a lot to you, and uh, and we're here to to support those efforts. Uh, great great network of collaborating collaborating organizations pushing towards safer streets. Terrific! I think that was twenty seven words, but that's great. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm gonna uh, ask uh, the technician to put up the uh, micro mobility moment now. Uh, we try. I try to end every program with a, a, a moment, sometimes humorous, sometimes serious. This is going to have a little of each, I hope. Uh, next slide, I'll show you that, as I mentioned, uh, two very prestigious and well-known organizations, the uh, People for Bikes and the League of uh, American Cyclists, which used to have an old-fashioned name, but now, because uh, they've been around since 1880-something, uh, they have online a, uh, an electric bike uh, education program. Obviously, it's not riding, but it's learning about bike, about safety, about batteries, which concern a lot of people. Uh, the website is up there on the uh, on the screen, and I encourage you, if you're thinking about it, this would be a great place to start. And then call uh, call Travis at the HBL and say you want to take a course, you want to learn more, or go buy one of the bike stores that has uh, electric bikes. They're very helpful about getting people started as well. And with a final slide is uh, a slide of some young man. Oh, that's me. Uh, that's me learning to ride a bicycle when I was about 14 years old. I was the last kid. I was always a slow bloomer. And this is how late I learned to ride a bike. Everybody else was riding them at three and four and five. And I finally learned to ride when I was almost a teenager. Uh, and I think just after this picture was taken, I ran into a tree, but it's, been, it's okay. I've been riding ever since. And I really encourage you to ride e-bikes, regular bikes, whatever. And I want to thank Travis. I want to thank Christopher uh, both tremendously for what you do every day and for taking this time, very busy time to uh, spend a little time with me talking about it. Yeah, thanks for having us. All right. And to thank you. both my regular listeners and anybody else who wandered in, I say thank you very much for watching. Uh, come back in a couple of weeks and we'll continue the, the saga of the two-wheel revolution. Uh, aloha. Thank you.